Hello everyone, this is Curtis Eckerman, and today I'm going to show you how to um, upload images into the website version of iNaturalist. I'll tell you off the bat that um, this is my personal preferred method of uploading images because it allows me to upload a lot of images at the same time and do a number of batch um, editing and things like that. Now I'll get to that, but in a previous video I showed you how to sign up for iNaturalist and create an account. I also showed you how to use the iNaturalist app on your smart device and Seek. So this is specific to how to add an observation to the website. And there are a number of advantages to doing this in particular um, if you are a large volume producer of photographs. For instance, if I see something that uh, I want to take uh, that uh, I see a new organism. I tend to take several pictures of it just to make sure that um, I get a good image that I can put into iNaturals for several images. It's not uncommon for me to take um, five to twenty images of a particular organism, especially if it's something that I haven't seen before. But I won't post all of those images in iNaturals. I do that so that I can get a number of photos that. Uh, are good just in case some of them might be out of focus or at the wrong angle. Uh, it's also really uh, uh, common for me to take a lot of images of an organism that's moving a lot just because I can't guarantee that I'll capture that particular organism uh, in the uh, frame of the camera. <clears throat> anyway, I am going to walk you through the process of, of uploading images into the website using some images that I have uh, captured recently. But before we do that, I want to talk about your images itself. One of the other main reasons I like um, uploading images into the website is that it gives me time to look at my images first and to uh, edit them and to crop them in particular. And I'm going to switch over quickly to Photoshop. This is not a tutorial about Photoshop. You can use any of course um, photo editor that you might have uh, access to. I know at Austin Community College you can actually get to Photoshop fairly cheaply as uh, ACC is a Photoshop uh, college. But uh, I wanted to show you a few examples of why it is I like to edit photos ahead of time before putting them into iNaturalist and, and, and even before I got to that part I wanted to show you this photo. Uh, it's always a good idea, if possible, and it's certainly not always possible, it's always a good idea to have some form of scale in your photo. And that can be a, something as simple as this, having my fingers in the photo. Uh, especially when I'm taking uh, photos of plants, I tend to put my hand in there somehow so that you get a sense of how large something is. And that can be an identifying character in itself. But it's just it's also just as easy to put down say a quarter or a ruler if you have one handy or something that has that people would identify as a standard size and this will help uh, give uh, you a sense of how big a particular organism is. Of course, that's not always possible simply because you're taking the picture too far away or the organism is moving too fast. But when possible, try to have a sense of scale. So let's look at a few other images. Um, I like to, so this is a pic picture of a dragonfly I took in my backyard, um, sitting, resting on uh, this plant. And I like to crop photos so that you can kind of focus on it instead of seeing this whole image. Um, I like to uh, focus in on the organism I want to identify. Some interesting things as I zoom in on this particular photo, I realize that eh, it's kind of blurry. It's not that bad. It's not that good. But I do notice I can see the wing bars pretty easily. I can see some stripes in the tail. So this is probably a pretty good image. I'm going to, again, this is not a Photoshop editor, but I can crop this particular photo so that whenever I upload this into iNaturals, it only shows this part. It's going to focus on the image and you're not distracted by um, the flower, uh, for instance. So I'm going to say save this. And that's, that's an image I'm going to use. I'm going to close this one. Uh, here's another image of a spider. Now, <clears throat> my initial reaction might be that this is kind of far away, but when I zoom in on this particular flycatcher uh, of spider, I realize that um, the photo is pretty good quality, and I can see patterns on the abdomen here. And so, this is a really good example of how why I would crop the photo. If I zoom out and just look at the photo as a whole, I may not be able to notice much detail here of the spider but if I zoom in I kind of select this area and crop 
this image, then it's going to show a bigger image of this spider in iNaturalist. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, exit this and save it. This is one of the ones that we'll add. I'm going to close this one because we've already looked at this. Here is another one of that same spider showing the front. This is an example of me taking multiple images. I actually took about 10 images of the spider that was moving around and jumping around. These two images happen to be pretty good. I'm going to crop it. And now I have two good images of this spider, one showing the back, one showing the front. As always with observations, you try to get as many good angles on the, uh, the, the organism as you can. Here's an example of another reason why you might want to edit your images. This one has two different organisms in it. This ladybug or lady beetle uh, was probably chowing down on these oleander aphids, but I want to make this into two observations. And I can certainly just copy this photo and post both of them, but I also like to make sure I'm highlighting. So I have two images here showing the same thing. I'm going to use this image to highlight the lady uh, beetle. I'm going to uh, a crop to the lady beetle so that again it makes it very obvious which one I am focusing on and I will save this one and then on the next photo I'm going to crop out to the lady beetle to make sure that I am focusing on uh, the aphids the oleander aphids here and uh, I can see if I scroll in, I can still see those pretty well. I know it looks a little fuzzy, but those little black lines, these Circe and these uh, legs, they're pretty characteristic of this particular species of insect. They're, they're a plant feeding um, insect. So I'm going to uh, highlight yes. Okay, so let's go back to our iNaturalist. And anywhere you go in iNaturalist on the website, up at the top is an upload button. And so I can go to explore, I can do other things, and I'm going to show you how to use other features in iNaturalist in a, in a, in a subsequent video, but this video is just focusing on uploading um, observations. Um, I'm going to go to Upload and just click Upload. I can either choose files or I can simply drag and drop files. So I'm going to show you I have a folder of images that uh, of, of, of things that I've taken pictures of and including for instance you can see over here the images I just edited and so those are images that uh, I can now drag and drop and I'm going to add a few I'm going to add I'm going to add a, a, a few of the images that I have edited I'm going to edit so I've got three pictures of this weevil um, I'm using control and my arrow to select images that I'm going to add. Eventually I'll add all of these. I just don't have them all edited. But uh, I'm going to add this beetle. I'm going to add uh, this uh, butterfly. And I'm going to add the oleander and the lady beetle. I'm just going to simply click left and hold and drag them on top of iNaturalist. And you can see what it's doing here. It's, it's uploading the images, but it's also uploading any data that's associated with that picture. So for instance, because I took these pictures with my phone, it captured the date um, and time that the picture was taken, and it captured the location because the GPS of my phone was turned on. I'm going to show you how to edit those here in just a second. But the first thing we want to do, you'll notice that right now it's showing that I have 10 observations but several of these observations are of the same thing and so the first thing we want to do is we want to combine the observations of the same organism and that's very simple for instance this weevil I've got an image here an image here and an image here I'm gonna decide which one I want to be first I like this one it's kinda of more natural the other ones in my hand uh, this is gonna be my first image so I'm gonna click on this one drag it over and drop it and do the same with the third image drag it and drop it now I've got three images you can see one of three so there's three images now associated with this particular observation and I'm ginna do that with my other ones I kinda like this picture down here for the beetle although I have another one I'm gonna drag it up there those are all of the same one I've got this butterfly I'm gonna combine and so now I have five observations some of them have multiple pictures with them okay um, now I need to update and make sure the data is correct on it. So I can click on individuals. I can click, for instance, if I need to change the time and date, I can click here on the calendar and change the date. I know these are correct. But I always, always want to check the location. And when I click on this, it's going to show me the location of that one, but it's going to show me the location of uh, all of the other um, 
uh, animals I've taken a picture of. So I'm going to zoom out. I'm using my scroll wheel to zoom out on this M map. And I, I'm, I know that this is pretty much where I took this image. I can also see the, see the satellite image here. Um, so this is a uh, location that I'm familiar with. I took a walk with uh, a, a friend of mine and we took images down here. Now, I don't know exactly if it's exactly right. Just know that when you take pictures with your cell phone, sometimes that data gets uh, a little scattered. The cell phone tower doesn't always give you exact location. So I can move this. First of all, I can click somewhere else. But you'll notice when I do that, I get this circle. This is a great tool here in iNaturalist. I can actually gra grab onto these edges and make this circle bigger. Basically, you're telling iNaturalist, hey, I don't know exactly where I got this picture, but I know it's somewhere in this red circle. And that's perfectly legitimate uh, to do that. In some cases, you may not even know um, where within the city you got it, and so you may have to uh, select the whole city or the, a whole county in some cases. Ideally, of course, you would be as accurate as possible. And you can see that by increasing the circle, what I've done is I've, I've changed the accuracy rating, if you will, down here. It's accurate within 100 meters, for instance, of, of, of this location. So I, I know it's a little bit closer than that. I'm going to leave it there. I'm going to update my observations. I could actually select multiple ones and edit them at the same time. I could, for instance, select all, or I can use, I can select off of this. I can select one, use control and select on another and select two. I can go off to the left and select the location and change both of those at the same time. Okay. Um, again, I'm happy with those locations. I can also multi edit multiple dates and multiple species all at the same time by selecting multiple observations. So I, I, I'm good with that. Now the, the place where I would want to select them all in particular is when I want to modify the notes. So one of the things that you should be doing with your observations is adding notes. Maybe um, what were the circumstances that you uh, that were around you when you were making these observations or any notes that you think are worthy. So in this case I'm going to say that uh, um, these uh, this observation was in a roadside ditch along a dirt road. Right? So that in itself might be um, a, a worthy note just because this is wildlife that's being found in the ditches alongside of a road. Whatever it might be, maybe you're going to make a comment about the weather or about something interesting that you saw. I can also go and edit uh, uh, one individually, so I'm going to click on this beetle. This uh, uh, this is called a, a, a milkweed beetle, and I'm going to also add individually. This beetle was on oops was on a milkweed plant. Now that's significant um, because of the fact that this beetle feeds on milkweed, and that's why it's red. Actually, sim similar to the monarch, it actually has toxins in it because the milkweed is toxic. In fact, all of these were on milkweed plants. If you look carefully, you can see that these are all pretty much the same plant. So I could have added them to all, or I can add it individually. All right, so that's editing um, my location and the date. Uh, you want to try to, again, make sure that you are as accurate as you know. Um, be as accurate on date and time and location as possible. You also have the option of changing the um, what others see about the location. Let's say that you're taking um, pictures of organisms around your home and you're not necessarily particularly comfortable with everyone seeing where you live. Well, you can change the um, uh, what people see as far as the location. For instance, you can make the location obscured or you can make it private. So obscured, basically what it'll do is it will uh, say that it's, it'll show a big area and say that it's somewhere within here. So you've st stored the actual location in iNaturalist, but others won't see it unless you give them permission. They won't see the accuracy. So it might be listed within a 10 square mile radius area, for instance. If it's private, then they can't see the location at all until you give the, uh, someone permission to see that. Um, I think it personally, uh, my own personal opinion is that you should try to leave everything public unless it is um, a situation where you're worried that somebody might go and try to collect that organism. 
Uh, this is true of, um, say, I know a lot of people uh, are looking for rare organisms like rare snakes, things like that. Or if you have an endangered species, that's a good case for making a, 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 a location private or uh, obscured. So if I know that this is a captivated organism, I would also mark captive, but none of these are captive. These are all wild organisms. Um, you can also tag them with various fields. We're not going to worry about that here uh, because this is more advanced. You can, so for instance, you can tag things whether they're male or female, adult or versus larva, uh, whether you caught them in a sweep net or you caught, found them in a black, uh, uh, at a black light at night. I mean, there's lots of ways that you can tag this. And you would tag it if you were interested in certain things. Um, some people are interested in looking at, let's say you're doing butterflies, they might tag the larva versus the uh, adult so that they can easily sort through those. Okay, now the main feature that you need to pay attention to is the species name. And I, I'm going to just click on the species name here. And this uh, AI interface, so this kind of uh, recognition software that iNaturalist uses, tries to automatically identify the organism based on the picture that you have. And its identification is only as good as a number of things. Your photograph, how good your photograph is, also how much data is present in uh, uh, the nearby area. So, for instance, if you're taking a photograph of an organism in an area where there's not been many other uh, uh, observations, it may have trouble trying to compare that to local organisms and finding a good match. Because it does use your locality data to try to look at nearby organisms to see if anything is uh, uh, similar. So, for instance, it's pretty sure that this is in the uh, Coccinella genus. And if you look down, you can see that the, there's a number of these that are very similar. You may decide or you may know that this is a seven-spotted lady beetle. Well, if you're not, don't worry about it. Just put coccinella. Some, um, as we'll see here in a moment, you'll, you'll see that in some cases, iNaturalist is even more unsure. And that's okay. You yourself are not necessarily responsible for identifying a particular organism to species, mainly because you are an enthusiast, you're interested, but maybe you're not an expert. And, and that's what other experts are for. It may also be that the image is simply not capturing enough of the characteristics to identify it properly. So in this case, I'm pretty sure it's a seven-spotted lady beetle, but I'm going to leave it at coccinella because I'm not an expert and somebody else certainly will be able to uh, come along and, and, and do that later. So I'm going to click on coccinella. I will tell you right off the bat that when, when iNatural says we're pretty sure, then that's usually a pretty good option to start with. You'll see that some other ones don't have that. For instance, this one shouldn't. It might. So I clicked on this. It's pretty sure it's in this genus, but this is, and, and I like this because it's a weevil, but it doesn't really know, uh, like this is a harder one to identify. It thinks it's in this genus. It's pretty sure. I'm going to go ahead and select it, even though I personally am not sure. iNaturalist is saying that it's, 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 it matches pretty well. And then I'm going to go over here and click on this one, and I can see this is also uh, matching pretty well. Milkweed. Now I can also type my own names. Let's say that let's say that none of these options actually look good to me. And, and that happens. Every once in a while, an image is such that it's, uh, the, the iNaturalist is not able to really pick out what it is that you're trying to identify. And it may have, along with these milk beetles or milkweed beetles, it might have uh, some true bugs and even a spider in there. Well, maybe you're at that point, you just don't know. What you would do is you would start typing what you know it is. That is to say, let's say you don't know specifically what this is, but you know it's at least an insect. So just start typing that, insect. And it's going to give you options. Now, unfortunately, you can't just hit return. You have to select the one that is most appropriate to what you started typing. So I'd have to let, uh, select insects. And because uh, if you just hit return, let me show you how this works. I'm going to type insect and just hit, I'm just going to hit, uh, and I don't click on it. It's not going to enter it in there, prop, in there properly. So you, you'll have to select that. So I'll have to type insects and I'll have to select it. Okay. Now, um, I actually think that this is, uh, again, if that's all you know, that's fine. Uh, but you try to get as close to it as you can. So in this case, I'm pretty sure that uh, the genus um, uh, Tetraops is, uh, is a pretty close 
a, a bet here. You need to try to do, do this identification at least with the recognition initially because what you're trying to do is you may not have enough expertise to do these identifications and that's fine. However, what you are trying to do is you're trying to throw it into the arenas of those that do know these organisms. By leaving identifications blank, it does not allow um, the experts to see the particular groups that they're interested in. So for instance, if I have uh, people that are interested in butterflies and I don't put this down as at least a butterfly, then they won't see that because it turns out when you go to do identifications, you can search based on certain groups. So a lepidopterist who is interested in butterflies and moths um, will go to identify and find things that need identification and will search for unidentified butterflies and moths. But if you don't have anything here, your unidentified butterfly will not show up in their search and therefore will not be seen by the expert. So you try to be at least give it something, at least identify it to the very basic thing that you know that it might be. So in this case, if I didn't know it was a clouded yellow, I would perhaps type in butterfly. And you'll see that it gives me that option. And I would at least identify it as that. Okay, in this case though, um, I'm pretty sure it's uh, in this genus Coleus. And over here, um, this case, it's an aphid. We know that it's, it's, it's an aphid. I, like I said, I was, I'm pretty sure it's an oleander aphid. In fact, in this case, it tells you it's not only visually sim similar, I'm gonna scroll down a little bit, not only tells us that it's visually similar, but it's seen nearby. However, the next option is a completely different group of, of insects, right? And so this is the large milkweed bug. It's, it's not in the same um, order here. So I'm just gonna choose aphis as the genus, and I'm good. Okay, and so I have added the information. I've made sure that my uh, uh, data is correct and I've added identifications. I've literally added hundreds of observations at once. And it, I, it, would, it takes me a little while, it takes, you know, might take me an hour or so to get everything sorted, but it allows me to upload a large number of observations at one time. This, this is to me the advantage of using the website over say the apps because the apps tend to only add, it really encourages you to add one observation at a time. This allows me to look at my photos first, edit them, crop them, throw away ones that I don't like, and then add them all at the same time. And then I can add notes at the same time as well. So if I wanted to add these five different observations through one of the apps, it would take me longer because I would have to go and do everything individually. I'd have to type in the data, type in the notes, things like that. All right, at this point, I'm gonna hit submit my observations and it'll take a few moments, depending upon how many observations that you're trying to upload. And then it will list them in your observations. All right, so I've got these top, it'll list them based on uh, when you added them. I can see those five organisms here. And at this point, all we would be doing is waiting for people to interact with them. And so we, I will discuss the uh, rating system in terms of research grade versus needs ID versus casual in a future video. But you can see how this works. Now, when somebody does interact with your observations. Let's say, let's go look at this one now. Let's go look at this milkweed longhorn beetle observation that we made. I clicked on it. This is what it looks like. It's showing me the location, it's showing me the pictures. It shows all three images that I added. I can see the note that I added here and this is what my identification was. Somebody will then come along and they will also either agree or disagree, maybe add a comment. A number of different things can uh, happen there at that point, but now I'm just waiting for someone else to interact it, uh, interact with it. So currently, I'm the only one that's made the identification, so it's it's stated as needs ID. All right, and so again, we'll go into editing. Let's say that I make this cop, I make this uh, observation, and I find out there's something wrong about it. Maybe I have the wrong date. Maybe I have the wrong location. I will cover that um, in a little bit on how to uh, adjust that. All right, I'm going to go back to my species list and just show you an example of interactions. So for instance, I've got, uh, here's an example of, let me give one where there's more interactions. Yeah, maybe not. Here's a gray hair streak. This is one that I added from the Austin area. Here's the images. And then somebody came along and agreed with it. And because they agreed with that particular observation, it's now a research grade. So 
Okay, that's how to upload uh, observations. In uh, uh, subsequent videos, I'll show you how to manage your observations. And then also I will show you how to use other features within iNaturalist, uh, including how to make identifications.